Oh, God is great. Amen. How great is He? How great is He? That's the question. That is the question. He is great enough to do anything that He wants to do. Good morning. God bless you. You, 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 you brothers of Christ, you followers of Christ, you. Amen. I'm sitting here thinking about Brian's song just now and, uh, you know, those lyrics he gives and takes away. And I, I never really thought about those lyrics in regards to, to my hair. But Brian, I appreciate that, man. I, I'm under conviction about that. I just never really surrendered my hair there. So, yeah, yeah. Amen, brother. <laughs> so good to see you. We, uh, we're going to be in the Old Testament as we start out this morning. And I invite you to find uh, your Old Testament first and foremost. We're going to go to a book that's a very, very special book. It has been near and dear in the hearts of the churches for centuries and centuries. Great book that we're turning to, and it's the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. And the value of this book is at least twofold. Essentially, there are two big things we get to learn from this particular book. One has to do with the man of God, Nehemiah, and the other, the plan of God through Nehemiah. Now, I don't know how much you remember the story, but I'm going to try to take you through it pretty fast today. First of all, the man of God, Nehemiah, is a tremendous model for us. He's a model of character. He is a man that had zeal for God. He had zeal for the things of God. And that zeal resulted in trust and faith and sacrifice and commitment and devotion and perseverance and initiative. And it takes all of that, amen, if you ever want to get anything done. Is that right? It sure does. And Nehemiah is a man who is out to get something done for the Lord. And he does. In this book we see a plan of God. And it's a model. That plan is a model for us corporately. This is the book that churches turn to when they're facing a project together, right? Because there is a process revealed. There is a plan that is exposed here whereby great things can be accomplished for the name of the Lord. And so, First Baptist Church of White Wright, understand you are in a project. You are. You are a project, just like me. But you're also in a project. And it has to do with this building, hallelujah, this beautiful place that God has provided for us. And so today, as we consider that, we want to consider getting this thing taken care of. Amen? I'm tired of it, are you? I hadn't been there very long, but I'm tired of that payment that we have to make on this particular building. And so we're going to look hard at Nehemiah, we're going to look at the man of God, the plan of God, and we're going to look a little bit at us this morning. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you and we thank you. We've already begun to praise you. We've already begun to thank you for who you are and what you have done in our lives and what we have and what we have coming because of your son, Jesus Christ. And we assemble here together today because we know it's all about you and we need you and we want you and you have, we have you because you have us sealed through the Holy Spirit and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father God, we are walking in a journey with you. And you have led us to this place. And it's a beautiful place that you have provided for us. God, we ask you to kind of help us to get on with finishing what you have started here today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take complete control of our time together. That you would fill us full of your spirit. That we would be excited, God, this morning. Believing and trusting that as we listen to your word, you're going to speak to us privately. You're going to speak to us corporately. You have a plan for us as a church body. So I thank you for that in advance. And I look forward, God, just, just praising you through this time together with my brothers and sisters as we, as we meditate on the word together. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, find Nehemiah. Go to the Psalms. Take a left turn about three books back and you'll be there. Okay? Nehemiah. Awesome book. Chapter 1, background information, 444 B.C. Nehemiah writes first person, probably from his memoirs. He is a cup bearer for the king. You know what that means? He's kind of a professional guinea pig, if you will. There he was, rubbing elbows with the king every day, tasting his food for him, tasting his drink for him, whatever the case may be, probably over all of the employees in the kitchen, making sure that what he tasted wasn't going to kill him and certainly wasn't going to kill the king. That's Nehemiah. That's his job. Extremely important, extremely powerful person. 
And there he is in this kingdom of his enemies, if you will. The Persian kingdom, modern-day Iran, in the capital of Susa. That's where Nehemiah is. And one day there's a knock on the door, and it's his brother, Hanani. And he comes to him with this report. And Hanani must have been a godly man to make that kind of a travel, that kind of a distance, travel that far. He must have been, and he must have been thinking, you know, I don't know what to do, but maybe my brother who rubs elbows with a king can help me. And so he knocks on the door and he says, here's the deal. The walls have fallen down around Jerusalem. The people are in distress and the doors have been burnt. And the Bible tells us when Nehemiah heard this, he was overwhelmed. He was undone because of his great love for God and love for his people. The Bible says he sat down and he wept and he mourned for days and he prayed and he fasted. I ask you, have you ever done that regarding your city? Have you ever done that? regarding the kingdom of God and its expansion into this world? Have you ever done that for your nation? Ever been a time when you fasted and you prayed and you mourned and you wept for all the things that's going on out there in our crazy world, all the things that we see on the television sets and all of that? Have you ever done that? This guy's serious. He is serious in his relationship with God. He's serious about his people and his heritage. And God gets a hold of him. And his zeal begins to rise up. And he begins to get convicted. And so the first thing that he does is he confesses sin. And we're in chapter 1. The Bible says this. We have acted very corruptly against thee, Lord, and have not kept your commandments nor the statutes, the ordinances which you commanded through your servant Moses. And he goes on. This is the best part. He, he remembers God's promises. And, and, he, and he reminds God of his promises. He says, remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. And they are your servants and your people, O God whom you redeem by, the great, by your great power and by thy strong hand. Oh, you ever do that with God? You ever remind God of his promises on your behalf or on behalf of somebody else? That's what Nehemiah does. He does this. And as he's doing this, as he's praying, he gets inspired. And I mean the burden comes upon him. He gets conviction. He gets committed he gets a vision, and it's a vision of himself being used by God to take care of this problem that he just heard about from his brother. He, he, he comes to this point along the lines of that old adage that says, if it's going to be, it's up to me. You know that adage? You ever say that? If it's going to be, it's up to me. Now, the Bible doesn't say he said that. But what happens is... He can't sit there any longer. He's got to do something. He can't just let somebody else take care of this problem. He can't just pass this off to somebody else. He's got to get involved. He's got to step out. He's got to act. And he does. And he steps out in faith. And God is orchestrating this whole thing, this whole time. He's there before the king again. The king notices his countenance is downcast and sad, and, and it's just God initiating through the king by saying, what's wrong, Nehemiah? And man, that's his cue. He's got the decision to make right there, and he goes for it. He gets bold. He says, all right, here's the deal. I'm not going to dilly-dally around with you, king. I'm going to tell you how it is. Here's the problem. My people are in trouble, and I've got to go help them. And the king says, okay, right? He says, okay. And not only does he say, okay, he says, here's the deal. I'll tell you what. I'm going to help you help them. I'm going to provide for you all the resources that you need to go help your people and accomplish this task you feel led to accomplish. That's God, brothers and sisters. Amen. That's how he works. He works in mysterious ways. And he works for the sake of his own name and his own glory. Hallelujah. We've got to get a hold of that. 
So Nehemiah goes. He takes that distance. He takes some servants and some laborers and some resources and all that. And he shows up in Jerusalem and he inspects the city at night. He walks around it. He analyzes it through the night. And he comes up with a plan. And the first thing he does is he gathers all of the people together, all of his people, all of those Jews together, right? And he tells them the story. He tells them the story about how he got there and what he feels calls to do, and he asks for a response because he can't do it alone. And in chapter 2 and verse 17, simply says this. This is his plea to the people. He says, come, let's build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a disappointment or a reproach. And the people simply say in the next verse, verse 18, yeah, let us arise and build it and put our hand to the good work. Simple as that. It's not complicated. It's, hey, let's go do it. God's leading. Okay, we'll step out and we'll do that. And in chapter 3, every family dedicates. In chapter 4, opposition comes. Same chapter, Nehemiah encourages anyway. Chapter 5, Nehemiah gets involved. He makes personal sacrifices, monetary sacrifices. He says, I'm, I'm going to do without some of the things that I'm used to doing with. And I'm also going to dig in. I'm going to help you build at the same time. In chapter 6, that opposition continues. But God is bigger than that. And the Bible tells us that same chapter, with everyone involved, the wall was completed in 52 days. And that's amazing, considering what happened. You remember many times, many days, those people were, they, were, uh, they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. 52 days, they got that wall rebuilt. Nehemiah says in chapter 6, verse 16, And it came about when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Hallelujah. And the rest of the book is just as awesome. Chapter 7, to the end, we see the people celebrate. And that's what you do when you see God move in your life. Amen celebrate and then they rededicate and they get organized as the people of God God's covenant keepers and they all sacrifice many things for the temple look at chapter 7 and verse 70 the Bible says this some from among the heads of the father's households gave to the work that's for the temple and the rebuilding of the city the governor himself that was either Nehemiah or his brother gave to the treasury a thousand gold drachmas, 50 basins, 530 priests' garment. And some of the heads of the father's households gave into the treasury of the work 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,200 silver minas. And that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,000 silver minas and 67 priests' garments. So there's this sacrifice that occurs. The people, each one of them, participate then the law is read by Ezra the priest. They pray, they ratify the covenant, and they rededicate themselves to the Lord and to one another. And it's an incredible story about the man of God and the plan of God, and it's a model for God's people, and it's a model that most churches follow, and I believe this church has been following at the same time in the construction of this incredible facility right here. But it's now time to finish the job. We've got to finish the job. Time is now. It's got to get done. This building was built, I know, for the glory of God. And it's got to be paid for to the glory of God. Amen? Yes, it has to be. It has to be. And by God's grace and God's favor and God's blessings and your sacrifice and your commitment and my sacrifice and my commitment, we will get it done. I believe that with all of my heart. I don't know about in 52 days. We could. But I'll tell you, the Lord laid upon my heart 52 weeks, and he laid that on my heart a long time ago. I had forgotten it was a 52 days here in Nehemiah until I was reading it the other day. And you, some of you are visitors here, you're probably going, oh my goodness, what have I walked into this morning? You're not obligated in any way. You understand that. We owe $1.1 million as a church. Can we pay that off in 52 weeks? Should we try? Brothers and sisters, I want to try. I want to try. I want to set that goal before you this morning officially behind this pulpit and say to you, let's do it. 
And some of you are saying already, you're probably going, oh, no way, we, can, we can't do that, we can't do that. Please don't say that unless you are a prophet, okay? Please don't do that. Don't get negative. I mean, I would rather err on the side of we can as opposed to we can't. Because my God can do anything. And I know that some of you have a history here of God doing amazing things in this church. He has. And they amaze me when I hear the stories. I'm here to tell you that this $1.1 million that this church owes is no big thing. As my friend Mike used to say, it ain't no big thing but a chicken wing. I don't know if Mike, I don't know where that came from. Is that a common phrase out there or is that just my weird friend Mike? What? Oh, well, okay. Well, it's no big thing. And, yeah, and, and it's a no biggie. It's a no biggie thing to me. It's a no fear, Caleb and Joshua, two spy thing as far as I'm concerned. Look, let me tell you. I praise God that I am here. I praise God that I have the opportunity to be your pastor and to be in this place in this time. I praise God that I get to inherit this debt. I praise God for that. I, I, I'm thrilled, I'm tickled that I get a chance to sacrifice for God and for you and for us as a body. I can't be more thrilled. It's awesome because I know my God. And it's a privilege and it's an opportunity. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. This is what makes life fun. This is the adventure. These kinds of things are the adventures that he calls us to. And it's a wonderful thing, and I hope you can catch that vision and that understanding of things. And not look at this thing as a horrible thing, but a beautiful thing and a wonderful thing and a great thing that's going to grow us and that's going to change us and can do incredible things in this body. I get the privilege to sacrifice for my God again. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I'm almost, I don't know what I'm trying to say, I'm almost 52 years old, okay? I know I don't look like it. No, I'm almost 52. Almost been walking with the Lord for 30 years, almost. And I've learned something. I sure got a lot more to learn. But I, I think I've learned this. Okay. God loves to throw us in the deep end. Okay. He loves to throw us in over our head. He loves to put us in situations whereby when we look at him, we think, oh, that's impossible. I can't do that. There's no way, God. You know what I'm talking about? He does. He does. As a matter of fact, if you're faced with a situation like that, that's probably a pretty good sign you're right in the center of God's will. Because, man, are you going to grow. He does that because he knows how we are. He knows what's in us. And he knows it takes things like that, not only number one, for us to lean on him and stay tight in that relationship. And number two, he does that so he can get the glory as he provides whatever it is we need to accomplish his will, his purposes, his way. You, you believe that? You buy that? You see that in your own life? I've seen it from two sources, my own life and the Bible. Think about this, you know, the Bible. We can start at the very, very beginning. We can go back to Noah. Noah, I want you to build a boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide. I'm going to bring all the animals in the world into it, okay? Even though you don't even know what rain is, it's never rained before, I want you to do that. I'm sure Noah was just undone, like, what? And then there's Abraham, you know, leave... You've established yourself there in Haran. Your family is there. Your fortune is there. Your homestead is there. I want you to pick it up, leave it, go live in a tent, and wander around with me for the rest of your days. And we, it just goes on and on. There's Joseph. You know, he calls Joseph. I want you to run this pagan nation, Joseph. Moses, I want you to overrun this pagan nation. I want you to cross that sea over there. Right? Joshua, I want you to strike up that marching band. Just, just blow the horns. Just blow those trumpets. March around it. Elijah, I want you to call fire down from heaven. David, I want you to kill Goliath with a stone. Esther, I want you to save a nation. Nehemiah, I want you to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem even though you're employed by your enemy. Daniel, I want you also to run this nation through four empires. Hosea, I want you to, I want you to marry a prostitute. 
Jonah, I want you to go evangelize your enemy, right? Mary, I want you to have my son. Joseph, I want you to raise the Messiah. You disciples, I want you to go raise the dead and heal the sick and cast out the demons. Paul, I want you to go suffer for my name and I want you to evangelize the entire world and turn it upside down. You get it? You think the Bible's trying to tell us anything? You think those guys felt like they could handle those jobs that God gave to them? The Bible is many things, but I think one thing that it certainly is, it's, it's a record, isn't it? It's, it? it's a record of God taking a common man and giving him an uncommon plan and doing extraordinary things through that man or with that man or woman. He calls men to go against the grain, right? To do things that he can't do in his own power and his own strength. And isn't that really your story too? Don't you have those kind of stories in your life? Man, I do. It just seems like all my life has been like that. God just keeps throwing me stuff that's way over my head. Salvation was the first thing. It's like, really, God, you want to, you want to forgive me? My sins are so astronomical in quantity and quality. There's no way you would do that. But God provided the grace, and He set me free. Hallelujah. He said, marry this young lady. God, I'm, I'm not qualified. She's too good for me. But He gave me the grace to step forward. Gave her the grace to say yes. Yeah. Bless your heart. You know, I was a new Christian. God said, I want you to teach this Sunday school class of high school boys. And, I, you know, I didn't have a church background. This is all new to me. It's like, what? And, you know, this fear rises up, right? Because you know, I don't know about how you are. Anytime God tells me to do something, you know what I do? I look at me. And I look at my strength, my ability, whatever, my resources, my talents. And then I get into fear. And I think, I can't do this. I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. You do that? Somebody please say yes so I have somebody to talk to. You know, but you step out. I mean, I guess the only thing I ever, ever had going for me is that I was such a rotten person, such a sinner, and God so radically saved me, I really did just want to obey Him for the rest of my life. I just had decided I just want to do your will. And so whatever you want me to do, and I told him that when I was going to say, I'll just do it, whatever you want. So I do it, but I'm sitting here terrified, shaking and nervous all the time and worried. And, God came and he said, you know, I want you to, I want you to quit your job, Dave. You've been an engineer for 11 years. And I want you to go into the ministry, go to seminary. I want you to quit all of that. Give up your company car, you know. I want Donna to go back to work. And I'm thinking, there's no way. How are we going to afford to do that? You know, so we're back down to $18,000 a year. You know, I got a phone call, though. It was from the church that I was going to, First Baptist in Coppell. And the guy called me in his office, and he said, did you know there, that we had a scholarship fund for seminary students? And I said, no, I had no idea. He said, we do. Why don't you apply for it? I said, okay. I said, how much is it? He says, well, if you go full time, it's a full ride. I said, are you kidding me? What? That church paid every penny of my seminary education for three and a half years, plus my books. Praise God. And God just continually is teaching me these things all of my life. God called me to pastor. I was terrified. I said, please, God, don't do this to me. Don't make me a pastor. I don't want to be a pastor. See, a lot of pastors have a lot of hard times. I was terrified. But he said to do it. He spoke profoundly. Love to tell you that story, how he spoke one day. It's, it's amazing. And it just keeps on going in my life. You know, children come. It's like, how am I going to be qualified to be a father? Oh, my gosh. You know, now I have five. What, what's up with that? I'm still shaking. Fear has always been an issue for me to have to battle. I don't know about you. Some people are confident. My wife just I, doesn't seem to have any fear in her life. She's confident. Praise God for that. Me, I've just had to struggle. You know, God just said, Dave, start a church. What? How, I, I, terrified. How am I going to do that? 
had my health was shot. I, I shared that with you once. My health was just shot, and he had me buy that crazy home out there that was shot as well. But he said, I'll be your strength. And he was. He had us adopt these kids, these last two. We had $1,000 in the bank. We had spent all of our savings on the first adoption and buying that house and trying to make it livable. And we had $1,000 in the bank four years ago. And he said, adopt two children from overseas. $80,000 price tag. Three years, I was able to make some extra money doing extra jobs and earn $15,000. And I'm here to tell you, God came up with $65,000. I'm bragging on my God here. You understand that? And I'm sharing it with you so you understand where I'm coming from and what I've seen in my life. And I've seen a big God. A God that provides for what He calls you to do. He does do it. He does it. And He delights to do it. And He does it all the time. And our job is to trust Him and to step out by faith and be obedient. Yeah, I've come to a point in my life where I'm just not really comfortable anymore or content unless I'm over my head. You know what I'm saying? If I'm not over my head in something, in over my head, I'm like, oh, I must be out of the will of God. Something, I must be coasting here. Something's not right. Well, you know, God's called me to the next chapter, the next adventure, the next over-the-head experience, and it's being the pastor of a church that's $1 million in debt. And there was a little bit of fear for a couple of days about that. And I had a friend say, you're crazy to take up a church like that. Let me tell you, that was not of God. Because God has put that peace in my heart and has since day one. I tell you this, I have never in my life been at such peace in my whole life as I am right now. I am so thrilled and delighted to be here. It is such a privilege. And you may call that crazy. It's not. I don't see this as a big deal. One million dollars, it's not a big deal. The only, thing, only you will make it a big deal, right? It's not a big deal to God because God says, I own it all. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. All the silver and the gold is mine. Every soul is mine. The earth is mine and everything in it. Everything. You know what I'm saying? How many of y'all know that God, since every soul is His, whether it's a redeemed soul or not, God can move a soul to do what he wants it to do. And he does it all the time. You and I, we may not have that kind of cash or money to pay that big debt off in a year, but God does. And God moves people in crazy ways to do crazy things. I understand that back uh, when this particular sanctuary was built, there was a man that wrote a check for $200,000. Hallelujah. Because every soul is God's. And God can turn a man's heart to do whatever he wants him to do. When I was at Coppell, I've shared this story with many of you. I'll say it again. Pastor prayed, get out of debt. They went into debt for a fellowship hall building, $100,000 they owed. One day he walked out of church, a farmer drove up, said, I heard you need some money. He handed him a check for $100,000. Paid it off. You know what I'm saying? It's no big thing but a chicken wing. Right? It's no big thing to God. He's got it. He's got it. He's got it all. And He's got you. And He owns everything and He owns you. And He's in you, so you own it. Everything is yours. The Bible even says that. You and I, we have. We have it. I'm telling you, if there was an emergency, if your life was threatened, you either give sacrificially and pay this thing off or die, I bet we could come up with a million dollars right now. I bet we could do it. It's just a matter of choices, isn't it? That's all it is. It's just a matter of choices. It's just a matter of zeal. It's a matter of devotion. It's a matter of sacrifice. It's a matter of love for God and neighbor. So I want to share with you the plan. Some of you have seen this. I've been trying to give you a heads up by having these little meetings, but I'm going to show it to you real quick right here. And it's a simple plan. It's, just, it's a just pay for it plan. Just pay for it. Okay? How do we do that? 
Equal sacrifice. Equal sacrifice. Paul talks about equal sacrifice in his book to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 through 15. Take that home and meditate upon that. I'm just going to paraphrase that for, for lack of time here. Paul, he says to the Corinthians, hey, remember those Macedonian churches, those churches down there in, the, in, in Greece, okay? And out of their affliction and of their poverty, they gave liberally, they gave by their ability and above and beyond their ability, and they begged to give more. Hallelujah. That's the attitude we've got to have. They understood it. They knew how big their God was. And then he says, okay, so that's a model for you, Corinthians. You need to be like them. You need to abound in your giving. You started this work of giving, now finish it. But God's not looking for equal gifts from you, Corinthians. He's looking for just an equal sacrifice. That's all he's looking for. And you know, equal sacrifice will get it. It will get it every single time. So here's, here's what we hope to do. Here's just a four-part plan. It's very, very simple. Okay? Very simple. The first part is this. Go to God, figure out what would be a sacrifice. Make a sacrificial offering by June 1st of this year. Okay? You say, well, what's a sacrificial offering? It's something that hurts. You know, a lot of times we give, but it doesn't hurt. That's why it's called a sacrifice, because it hurts. Figure out something that's going to hurt. Give your best. Right? It's that feeling of loss, yet for a good cause. Praise God. It's something that we give up at personal cost. I like this illustration of this Sunday school teacher who asked her 10, 10 year olds if they would give $1,000 to missions. And they all screamed, Yes! Yes, and you can just see little 10-year-olds getting excited and pumped up. And then she said, well, how about $100 to missions? Yes, yes, we would do that. We would do that. Well, how about just a dollar? Yes, they all screamed except one little boy. And he kind of put his head down like this. And the teacher said, Johnny, what's wrong? Why didn't you say yes? He said, because I have a dollar. <laughs> yeah. And isn't that the way it is, though? We all talk about sacrifice all the time and we know we should be sacrificing for the Lord Jesus Christ because He did for us, but when it comes right down to it, it ain't easy to do. It's not. But you and I always have that privilege of doing it. So that's plan one. Raising a million dollars will not happen unless everybody is willing to make a sacrifice, just a sacrificial offering. Step number two, figure out how you can either cut out the waste or increase your income and for one year make sacrificial monthly donations. Okay, for one year. Everybody figure out how much can we give on top of what we're already given for a year to put toward that building plan. And then number three would be to kind of make a stretch goal. Because over the year, you're going to see more things. God's going to reveal more things. God's going to do more things. Probably God's going to be blessing you back in all sorts of different and, and, and wonderful ways. And so put a stretch goal out there. See how much more you could possibly give over a year's time. Finally, number four, we'll fundraise. Now, how many of y'all love fundraisers? That's what I thought. I don't either. I don't like them either. And I sure don't want to fundraise to death, and you don't want to hear me talk about money to death and any of that. But for one year, we'll do some fundraising. And we've got some pretty creative ideas that have come out so far. I'm really, really excited about it. I kind of can't wait to kick some things off. Chris and I have got, Chris came up with one, and we're, not, we're, we're just going to hold back on it. We'll share that with you a little bit later. But there's something pretty, pretty interesting that's coming. Now, let me just share with you a couple of rules, and we're, we're fixing to close down here in just a minute. But I want to say this, if you choose to participate, please understand that all of that has got to be above and beyond what we regularly give, okay? Because we're not making budget right now. And the other thing we have to understand is we're not making budget right now. Did you hear me clearly about that? We're not making budget right now. And we haven't been for six, for the last five months, four months. That's got to change right now. 
it has to change or we're going to have to start cutting the budget and the only places to do it really are missions and ministries and salaries and we don't want to do that we're about seven hundred and fifty dollars short every week and i'm thinking surely we can handle that and the thought is if everybody could just give one more percent of what you're already given or if you're not given if you could just start then we wouldn't even have to go down that road we could continue to fund the ministries and the missions that we're doing right now I really I don't want to go there and it seems silly that we would have to make cuts considering the fact that God says give and it will be given unto you right let's let's be believing believers on that one okay I ask you I've already been giving I've, I've mentioned it two or three times already from here I've made my commitments to, to increase. I ask you to do the same thing so that we can take care of that, okay? Five step to plan. Now, let me show you a model real quick. Some of you have seen this. I was sitting here thinking about, well, could we really, if we all just sacrificed equally, could we come up with a million dollars? So I started playing around with the numbers here, thinking that every person has a unique situation Every person doesn't make the same thing, of course. Every person doesn't have the same amount of assets and resources and so forth and so on. And so I'm just playing with the numbers thinking, you know, we have about 90 to 100 people that are here on a regular or semi-regular basis. So if we base all of this on 100 families and we, we figure that some families have more than others, you can see this little chart here kind of on the, on the, the lines of a ladder. And you could see if that was accomplished, not that God would just do things just like that, but it's just an idea to say, you know, it really is possible. It is possible. You'd say, you mean really for someone to, to, to give $50,000? Yeah. It's already been done. Praise God. It's already been done. One family. We have three more? No. You don't have to raise your hand on that. Look at that bottom number, $2,500. Do you think you can come up with $2,500 in a year's time if you sacrifice something, you know, sell something or just take a chunk out of savings or whatever or just over a, plus over a, a, a year make some payments? I was thinking, you know, at $10 a day, and sometimes I spend $10 a day on, on Cokes and paydays and a lunch and another payday and another Coke, you know, $10 a day, five days a week is $2,600. And we're at equal sacrifice, not equal giving, but what if everybody gave $2,500 times 100 family? That's a quarter of a million dollars. That's a quarter of a million dollars. Just by not doing, wasting that stuff on, you know, refined foods and sugar and all that stuff. It's not so hard, folks. I don't think it's that hard. Now, the alternative is to go the way of the world, to get into debt, to finance this thing. The best financial product out there is 15 years at 5.5%. There's just three problems with that. Number one, we probably can't qualify for that kind of a loan based on our giving history. Number two, even if we could, we'd have to make $9,000 a month payments. We're not making budget now. If we were making budget now, that would be an extra $6,000 we'd have to come up with every month for 15 years. And even if we could do that, we would have paid $517,000 out in interest. That just doesn't seem to me like it's wise, considering what we could do with that kind of money in terms of reaching people for Jesus Christ and getting tracts and Bibles out there and helping widows and orphans and, and taking care of the hunger problem and so forth and so on. So it seems to me that it just makes more sense to see if we can reach this goal in a year's time. And let, put it in the Lord's hands. Everybody does their part. We put it in the Lord's hands. And that's all we can do. Amen? And I'm here to tell you I'm in. I am in. I am committed. And your elders are committed. And your staff is committed. And right now, between those seven families, $100,000 has been pledged. And 130,000 is a stretch goal. Okay? That's just seven families. There are 93 families left. And you might say, well, Brother Dave, I didn't, I didn't vote for that building program. And I would say to you, I didn't either. But this is my church. And this is my home. And you are my family. Whether you like me or not, I'm in the family. And I love you. And I'm here to help. And I'm here to serve. 
okay? I want you to think about that. I also love my brother, Mr. David Plyler. I don't know him, but I love him because he's a generous and godly man, obviously. You know, he constructed all of this at cost, which if you're in the construction business, you know that that probably means it cost him. And he financed it at a very low rate of 3%. But that arrangement ends January 1. It ends. We don't owe a bank. We owe a man. We owe a brother in Christ. And I encourage you to please take this seriously. Take it to heart. Because it's a beautiful thing when the brothers and sisters come together and we sacrifice for one common goal. And that is to bless a brother, bless God, partner with Him, grow through it, get this burden off our backs so we can get out there and get to business doing the things that we need to be doing for the kingdom of God, putting our money in that, in missions and in ministry and evangelism and discipleship. I've asked a few of you all, if you would, to pass out some folders. I've got some folders I want to give to you. Some of you have already received them. Maybe you've lost them by now. I don't know. I hope not. But anyway, we'll give you another one right now. And it just has a recap in there of our situation, a pledge card, and some ideas about how to save some money, how to make some money, etc., etc., how to come up with some funds. Please take it seriously. The idea is on June 1st to have an in-gathering day. That's about four weeks away. We'll have an in-gathering Sunday. And what that means, what I'm going to ask you to do, is turn that pledge card in. And secondly, Make a sacrificial offering on that day if you can. Now I realize, you know, as people sacrifice this or that, you know, sometimes you can't time that real well. But if you can, we want to take that sacrificial offering up that day. And we want to take that money and we want to go give it to Mr. Plyler and pay down that debt as much as we possibly can. And let him know that we're serious. And if possible, if he would be gracious enough maybe to extend his financing offer to us at least till the end of next June. I want to close with a story very quickly. It has a, 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 it's, it's about an, a man by the, by the name of Dr. George Truitt. Are you all familiar with that name? Yeah, he was a pastor here once, wasn't he? Very famous man. Well, he was helping a struggling congregation raise money for their church building. And they still needed $6,500. Must have been a long time ago, huh? And Truett found the response very, very weak in the congregation. So with only 3,000 pledged, he said in exasperation, Do you expect me to give the other 3,500 needed to reach your goal? I'm just a guest here today. Suddenly a woman near the back stood up. And looking at her husband, seated on the platform, who was recording pledges, she sh said in a, in a shaking voice, Charlie, I wonder if you would be willing for us to give our little home. We were offered exactly 3,500 cash for it yesterday. If the Savior gave his life for us, shouldn't we make this sacrifice for him? And Truett reported that the fine husband responded with equal generosity. Yes, Jenny, I was thinking the same thing. So turning to, Tru to Truett, he said, Brother Truett, if it's needed, we will raise our pledge by $3,500. Silence reigned for a few moments, and then some of the folks began to sob. And those who 15 minutes earlier had refused to do more now either added their names to the list or increased their donations, and in a short time, their goal had been achieved. Great things happen when everybody does their part. Beautiful things, incredible things, as God is in the middle of it. Amen. Equal sacrifice will take care of this problem. Will it take care of it in a year? That's in God's hands. I don't know. All I know is that I have to do my part. I have to seek God and know what I'm to do. And if you'll do the same thing, then we will have done what we're supposed to do. Amen. Let's take care of it. Let's put this behind us. Get on down the road. I want to close in prayer. If you'd like to join me, I'd, I'd love for you to pray. Let's stand as we pray. Father God, in, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you.
the God of creation, the God that owns it all, that created it all, that's in control of it all, that moves it all around. Oh, God, your plan is so far beyond us, it's amazing. And Father, as we look at you, as we look at your creation, surely we say, yeah, nothing is impossible with God. Father, we face an issue, as you know, and, and uh, I praise you for it. I thank you, God, that we have this issue. I thank you for the privilege of being able to participate in taking care of it. Father, you tell us that we're to boldly approach your throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in our time of need. So, God, I ask you, just boldly, not conceitedly at all, but just boldly, Lord, would you please provide to us $1.1 million and do it however you want to. Father, we ask also that you give us the privilege of being a part of, of that, that you give us the privilege of being able to sacrifice for you in light of all that you've done for us. Help us not to be so materialistic, God. Help us to have faith and trust. Help us, oh God, to step in, God. And believe, Lord, all of those scriptures whereby you tell us that you'll meet our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. All those promises, Lord, like bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, you told Israel. And you said that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out so many blessings that we would not have enough room enough for them. And Lord, those promises in the New Testament whereby you tell us, God, that give and it will be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing, it will be poured into your lap. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Father, we look at that first church. We see their devotion to all of those things, teaching and fellowship and prayer, and also giving whereby they share their things so that nobody lacked. I pray, God, you'd raise up a spirit that same spirit within this body, the spirit of giving for your name's sake and for your glory. And God, I pray if there's one soul here who's never just sacrificed their life back to you, God, they would be burdened to do that today and give themselves to you first, Lord. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this body. I thank you for what you're doing and you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, for those that have already jumped on and committed so much. What an encouragement that is. So, Father, take us from here where we need to go. And, Father, as we come again Sunday by Sunday, working to June 1st, Lord, I pray, Lord, that whatever it is that we do, you'd be pleased with it and you'd be honored by it. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, just for that privilege once again. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. I'll be down front if I can pray for you for any reason. Or if you just need to come, please do that.